invite you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 27. If you were here last week, we did uh, Palm Sunday, and um, I was talking about kind of the chronology of um, from the moment Jesus rode in to town on the donkey. He was fulfilling a number of prophecies, and um, we kind of looked at his his early habit was to go into Jerusalem and then come back to Bethany and spend the night. And we left off last week on a Tuesday night, I believe it was. Um, so these, this week, Holy Week, a lot of people call it Holy Week. It ends up on the eighth day is the, today, Resurrection Day. Uh, just a lot of uh, very important things happened, obviously. And uh, we were talking about the prophecy, uh, Zechariah some, you know, around 500 years before it happened. And uh, Daniel talked about it too in chapter 9. And Daniel, um, there's people smarter than me have figured out his prophecy about the 69 weeks and then the cutting off of the Messiah and then the 70th week. Um, he said that that would happen 173,855 days after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. And uh, King Artaxerxes did that on March 5th, 444 B.C., and it actually c comes out exactly to the day. If you allow for uh, the 25 days between March uh, 5th and March 30th, and then you account uh, for um, leap years and that type of thing, it comes out to the exact day. Who could do that besides God? It's an amazing thing. 500 years before it happened, um, Jesus rode in not only in the manner that was prescribed on a donkey, on the foal of a donkey, actually, but the exact day he offered himself to the nation of Israel to be the king. Um, and then Matthew 11 there, that first day, he comes in and looks around the temple, and it's already kind of late in the day. So he returns to Bethany, and uh, the second day, Monday of Passion Week, uh, he's coming back from Bethany to Jerusalem, and you know the, uh, the object lesson he has there is the fig tree that was not bearing fruit, and he used it as an illustration of the nation Israel. Israel is described by some of the prophets as uh, a fig tree, and Israel was supposed to produce fruit, um, influencing the Gentile nations to fall in love with their uh, Messiah, with their king, with their God. Just like we are today, by the way, the church is supposed to be bearing fruit, telling other people about Jesus Christ before it's too late. And then he cleanses the temple. That was another thing. Not only was Israel supposed to be a, a lampstand and a, 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 a pointing light to say, come to our God, to the Gentiles, they even prohibited people from participating in the temple. Uh, there was you know, the money exchangers and the people there trying to make a fast buck. And so he cleanses that temple and, and uh, runs the people out. So third Tuesday, the third day was Tuesday. And um, by then, the religious leaders heard what he had done, cleansing the temple. Hey, who gives you the authority to uh, do these kinds of things? And they challenge his um, uh, divinity and his um, uh, rule. And then in Matthew 24 and 25, as he's returning back to Bethany, the late that afternoon, he gives the Olivet Discourse, probably one of the, you know, maybe the second most important sermon after the Sermon on the Mount. And then um, after an intense day Tuesday, debating the chief priests and, and giving the disciples the um, Olivet Discourse, he returns to Bethany and actually stays there that whole next day, Wednesday. So remember, uh, I, I titled my message... <laughs> coming around the mountain. Uh, the Mount of Olives, he, he would come in around from Bethany into Jerusalem, and then he would go back about a five-mile round trip. And uh, so on Wednesday, he and the 11 disciples are kind of resting, and he's going to be receiving some unique worship with the uh, perfume that is broken and, and spread on his feet and stuff. And so um, while that's occurring, Judas heads off to the Sanhedrin to plan the betrayal. So, so the fourth day, Wednesday, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 26, John 11. Um, I found it kind of interesting. There's a, it may have happened twice. 
this uh, breaking of the alabaster and the perfume being uh, spread on Jesus Christ. Uh, one is an act of worship. It's also, uh, he says, it's preparing him for his burial. Um, if it happened twice, it's both by a lady named Mary, and it was for 300 denarii. That was the value of it. We know that because Judas said, hey, you know, what's, what's this waste all about? We should have sold that to the poor. You know, uh, hypocrites can sound so pious, can't they? And um, if it's only one person doing this, it only happens one time, it's referred to by the gospel writers, uh, this Mary is described interestingly as she's the sister of Lazarus who was raised from the dead. And uh, the, the uh, big shots, the religious people say, Man, if, if Jesus is supposed to be a prophet and he doesn't know what kind of woman this is and describes this Mary as a sinner. So maybe it happened twice. It's kind of not clear in the scripture, at least to me. But we do know what happened. And it was an act of worship. Jesus received it. Judas was offended. He agreed to uh, betray Jesus. Then the fifth day, Thursday, is kind of where we're going to pick it up today. And then we're going to use Matthew chapter 27 to flesh this out a little bit for not just the chronology of this week's events, but the characters involved. And I'm going to give you 10 of them, and they each have a unique lesson for us, so I hope you won't miss this. Um, <coughs> Jesus gives instructions to a couple of his disciples to go and make preparation for the Passover. They're going to observe it together. And um, I, I just, uh, one of my pet peeves, uh, the Christmas story, you know, we talk about the innkeeper and where, you know, there's no room in the inn. It's our, actually, katalama is the word for guest room, and it's used here again. When uh, Mary and Joseph came in, she's pregnant, you're going to deliver uh, Jesus Christ, and there's no room in the guest room for them, so they ended up out in the stable, but uh, it's just one of my weird things. Um, the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Last Supper is the Passover. They make it pretty clear. Uh, and John gives us the upper room discourse during that time, the Last Supper, the Passover. Um, they're in this uh, guest room, the upper room. And uh, John gives us that whole, the high priestly prayer and the prediction of Christ coming back and the prediction of the Holy Spirit and a lot going on there that the synoptics leave out. So... Uh, the Last Supper, the Upper Room Discourse, that's on Thursday. Um, after supper, instead of going all the way back to Bethany, they only go as far as the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, you guys know, you remember what goes on there. He asks his disciples to um, watch and pray. Um, he knows the betrayer is about to come. He knows there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on there. He's sweating great drops of blood. He's torn. His humanity knows that what lies ahead is going to be extremely humiliating and painful and, in fact, fatal. And so he's praying and he's wrestling. And the flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. And God um, says there is no plan B. The Father said this is our plan, and the Son says, so be it, your will be done. And he sets himself for the next uh, 39 hours. Early Friday morning is the betrayal. Sometime after midnight, maybe around 2 o'clock, 2.30, um, his friend, supposed friend, comes and betrays him with a kiss. So incredible drama going on here. And, uh, you know, Pastor Bill, why are you spending so much time on this? It's interesting how much time God devotes to it in the scriptures. Thousands of years are covered from Genesis to uh, Revelation. But God really focuses in on this week. Here's some examples. Um, in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's only four chapters devoted to uh, the first 30 years of our Lord's life. Uh, just four chapters. Not a lot said because it doesn't have eternal significance. Um, there are 85 chapters devoted to the three and a half years of his ministry in the Gospels. So God places the emphasis not on his whole life, but on the last three and a half years of his life. Of those 85 chapters, 56 are given to the entire period up to the triumphal entry. Um, 
we celebrated that last Sunday. Um, the start of the last week, while well, 29 chapters concerned the last week alone. So God places his emphasis on the last week. Not just the three and a half years, but the last week. Uh, of those 29 chapters covering the last week, 13 are devoted to the very last day. Uh, sundown Thursday to sundown Friday. So God, again, out of all the Bible, <laughs> he's focusing down on Good Friday. Uh, the events of Good Friday constitute 584 verses in the Gospels. 219 of these are, are devoted to the uh, just between 2 o'clock and 2.30 a.m. So the betrayal, the arrest, the six trials of Christ, and all that concludes by 6.30 in the morning. So in less than five hours, God is focusing the entire Bible on this incredible death of his son. It's said that there's a scarlet ribbon going all the way through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. That scarlet ribbon represents the blood of Jesus. Uh, the ensemble just sang about that blood a moment ago so beautifully. <clears throat> when it's, a, it's applied to my account, it's more than adequate to pay for all of my sins. The remaining 265 verses cover all the other events, including the Passover, the upper room, the high priestly prayer, Gethsemane, carrying the cross, the crucifixion, including his seven statements from the cross, which are incredible by themselves, uh, but we don't have time to go through that. So um, Jesus Christ, the word, came to die. And God, of all the stuff he said in the Bible, he's focusing on this sacrifice that is so, um, it's precious to him. He knew what was going to happen. He knew what was necessary to pay for the sins of the human race. And he did that in such a wonderful fashion. And he told us, in some cases, Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus was born. Incredible detail. Psalm 22 and well, 21, 22, 23, the whole trilogy there, but Psalm 22, the description of the crucifixion before there ever was such a thing. People didn't even kill people that way when Psalm 22 was written. I just read uh, to start our service, Psalm 30, the, the feelings of the Son of God being crucified and um, in Sheol for 39 hours, and then God raised him up. The resurrection that we celebrate today is so vitally important for so many things, but principle among them, it demonstrates that the father was satisfied with the sacrifice of the son for all of our sin. That's an amazing thing. We should never get over the wonder of that. So the sixth day, early Friday morning, um, the Sanhedrin has enlisted the help of the Roman cohort uh, to arrest him in the garden. Uh, typically, a cohort might have as many as 600 soldiers. They probably didn't need that many. But they brought, uh, the Bible says, the synoptic authors call it a multitude of soldiers. So it's a big group coming to arrest a single man. Uh, John records that at Jesus' statement, I am he, the soldiers all fall back. You know, Jesus kind of initiates when they show up. Who are you looking for? Uh, we're looking for Jesus. Of Nath I am he. In fact, I put there in italicized he doesn't appear in the original language. He says, I am. Equating himself with God Almighty. And the incredible thing is, however many soldiers are there, when he says, I am, they all fall on their butts. And incredibly, they scramble to their feet and arrest him anyway. But he says, I am, two or three times in that section. Not I am he, but I am. And looking out for his disciples, he said, you're coming after me, let these people go. And that, that right there is a fulfillment of prophecy too. It says uh, he did this so that he could fulfill the scriptures that he would not lose a single one of his followers. <coughs> In that John 18, remember Peter, uh, you can count on me, God. <laughs> and he lunges forward and chops the ear off of the servant of the high priest. Malchus, and Jesus, again, incredibly, Jesus, in his hour of extreme drama, Jesus takes the time to heal this man, 
and it's witnessed by a number of people in close proximity, and they still arrest him. Why? Because God is in control of this. It is God's will for his son to die. Nobody took his life, Jesus said. I'm laying it down for you and for me. So on Friday, the six trials of Jesus, a lot of that is mockery. Uh, Some of it's illegal. Uh, The crucifixion of Jesus, we don't need to go through the details right now. The final statement, seven things he says on there. First one, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Probably addressed the Roman soldiers, but at least... Uh, he, was a, he was expressing, after he had been scourged, after he had had this crown of thorns pressed down into his flesh, after he had been mocked and maligned, first thing he said, Father, forgive them. Um, it ends, those seven statements ends with, it is finished. And uh, by the time, you know, these Roman soldiers were experts in this crucifixion by now, And typically, a guy that was being crucified, at the end, he couldn't even whisper. Jesus, it says, with a loud voice, declared, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Loud enough, people there heard it. Highly unusual. Probably one of the things that motivated the centurion. Truly, this man was the son of God. We're going to look at the centurion in just a second. So, um... Shift our gears a little bit here. So from chronology, this incredible seven plus days, uh, we're going to shift our chronology to uh, now we're going to look at character, 10 of them, and they're all in Matthew chapter 27. Um, In your fill-ins there, uh, first of all, Judas, uh, the first five verses. Now when morning had come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him up to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And he threw the pieces of silver into the sanctuary and departed. And he went away and hanged himself. Uh, 30 pieces of silver. It's the price of a slave. And so the danger in Judas, uh, there's a lot of things going on in his life. But the one thing I want to point out here is the danger of giving in to a, a sum so paltry. 30 pieces of silver. And in fact, uh, we know he is described as uh, he was the guy that carried the money bags for the disciples. And he used to put his hand in the offering plate once in a while. And he was concerned about uh, this perfume being uh, wasted on worship of Jesus Christ. Why didn't we sell it and give it to the poor and all that kind of stuff? Judas was motivated by money his whole life. And yet look at what happens once he agreed on a cheap price for this friend that he had spent three and a half years with, day in and day out. He saw the miracles that Jesus did. He recognized the declarations that his, I am the son of God. I am the Messiah. And all these things, he was still willing to give Jesus over to the bad guys for 30 pieces of silver. And what happened? He ended up throwing it away anyway says here, (laughs) once he saw that Jesus had been condemned, well, what was he thinking was going to happen? He had already met with them the day before there. And uh, once he saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse and returned the 30 piece of silver. Now, the sad thing in here is uh, remorse does not equate with repentance. Yeah, uh, his plans went awry. Whatever he was planning on happening isn't going to happen now. He's sorry for his part in it, but he's not repentant. And I put in your notes here a warning. When tempted to give up on yourself, don't give up on God. Um, Young people, um, they've been lied to by a lot of agencies and 
uh, people. And uh, one of the things they're lied to about on a regular basis is sex. Um, a lot of young people uh, take it, it's almost cavalier now. And once they give away their purity, they can never get it back. And uh, our culture is saying, that's okay, that's, a, that's just a small price and it's worth it. How frequently people are brokenhearted and ashamed and feel guilty. And instead of allowing that to motivate them to genuinely repent and come back to God for forgiveness, they go deeper and deeper and deeper. The most um, frequent, the demographic that has the, the highest degree of increase in suicides, young people. Young people have so much to live for, but they have been lied to all of their lives. Like sex is just something that happens. Don't take it too serious and you'll be fine. You know, another thing young people have been lied to, <laughs> and um, the rest of us too, by the way, we forfeit our liberty for empty promises from Satan. Um, Satan had entered Judas. He started believing a lie that, boy, if we can just tone this Jesus character down, we'd have peace and we can influence him to do our will or whatever. And uh, our people are lied to all the time. Just give up your liberty and you can trust us. We'll take care of it from here. We'll provide everything you need. That is a lie. That also contributes to depression and suicide. Young people have been lied to. You come from nowhere. You're going nowhere. So if life sucks, just end it. Look, don't be a Judas to yourself. Don't, be a, don't betray your incredible value created in the image of God. With a, He's got plans for you. You've got a wonderful future. If you mess up, don't go jump off a cliff. Don't say, well, what's the use? I, I've screwed up now and God doesn't love me. Of course he does. Jesus Christ paid for your sins. Don't run from God. Run to God. And we need, the rest of us need to understand there are real born-again Christians who struggle with guilt, who struggle with embarrassment, who struggle with failure. And we need to come alongside them, not condemning them, not judging them, but say, hey, how can I help you walk through this? I'm with you. I'm praying for you. I love you. And God loves you. Don't jump off a cliff. Well, here's another group here, verses 6 to 10. And the chief priests took the pieces of silver and said, it's not lawful to put them into the temple treasury since... Well, now they're worried about the law. And they counseled together and with the money bought the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. For this reason, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then that which was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet, another fulfilled prophecy, uh, and they took the 30 pieces of silver. In fact, Jeremiah specifies 30 pieces of silver, not 31, not 29, 30 pieces of silver, and he says what they're going to do with it. The price of the one whose price has been set by the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord um, directed me. Specific prophecies. And then uh, verses 41 to 43, still the chief priest, and in the same way the chief priests also along with the scribes and elders were mocking him and saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we shall believe in him. That's a lie. In verse 43, he trusts in God. Let him deliver him now if he takes pleasure in him. And he said, I am the son of God, all these things. The chief priests uh, were exhibiting here this idea of piety. Oh, well, we can't take this blood money and put it in the temple treasury. So we'll have to find another use for it. They pretend to be religious and righteous, but their piety is very shallow. Satan can sound so pious, like Judas over this costly perfume and all that stuff. Um, God doesn't care about the length of our robes. He cares about the depth of our heart. He doesn't care what 
pretense we put on and we've got these things on our forehead and we've got these things on our wrists and we look so religious and our heart is so far away from God. God, deliver us from piety. From Let's, let's be genuinely uh, following Jesus. So our warning is quit looking religious and start acting godly, holy. There's a third group here. The crowd, verses 11 to 23. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. A lot of people say, Well, Jesus never claimed to be the king. He never claimed to be God. Yes, he did. Read the book. It's in here. Verse 12. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he made no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge, so that the governor was quite amazed. How many prisoners do you think came in front of this governor? And so I, I didn't do it. I'm innocent. You know, ask this person, ask that person. Jesus, not a word. Why? Because prophecy. Just like a lamb is quiet before the shearers, so will Jesus Christ be silent before his accusers. Now, at the feast, the governor, verse 15 now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the multitude any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they were holding at the time a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And when therefore they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that because of envy they had delivered him up. And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders, check out what they did with the crowd. They persuaded the multitudes to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they shouted Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. What evil has he done? But they kept shouting all the more, saying, let him be crucified. Now, obviously, this was predicted. It had to happen. But I wonder, what would have happened if there was a couple courageous people in the crowd and said, we don't want that murderer released into our streets to do it again. We want the man that's been accused falsely. There's no evidence again against him. We want Christ released. Now, it wasn't part of God's plan. He came to die, and so it never happened that way. But I wonder if there's things that I could influence in my community, in my state, in my family, in my circle of friends, if I would just speak up instead of going along with the crowd and they're maligning somebody, they're criticizing somebody, they're crying in their beer about something. Not that I drink beer a lot, I'm just saying. <coughs> um, what if there was just some courageous people that would stand up for what is right? I think a lot of us, we're intimidated into silence. I don't believe that the majority of America, for example, <coughs> agrees with what's going on. But the silent majority is still silent, unfortunately. So the crowd, uh, the danger is going along with the pack. This crowd, by the way, the same crowd, just five days earlier, <laughs> what are they saying? Hosanna, this is our king, this is our Messiah. Same crowd, largely. And now, what are they saying? They're being influenced by these guys with the long black robes. Those guys that have all the power, they can say who can come into the temple and not. They could really make my life miserable. I better not go against them. I better just go along with the pack. And so they did. Going along with the crowd, you'll find yourself on the wrong side most of the time. It's so easy to see these days. Somebody <clears throat> posts something on Twitter or Facebook and the whole world condemns that person. And then a month later, the truth comes out that they're actually innocent. 
but nobody pays attention. Why? Because the crowd jumped on this right away, became a majority viewpoint, and then when somebody comes up with the truth and say, you know, it didn't really happen that way, silence. We need to speak out. We need to be courageous. We need to quit following the pack or the party or the whoever influences you. Think for yourself. Informed by scripture, think for yourself and don't follow the pack. And that's not just directed at young people. That's directed at the Q-tips among us too, the white-haired folks. Uh, we're mature enough, we should know better. We should not feel threatened by what other people think. I want to do, what does God think? And I need, I need a backbone. I need the spirit to help me. I need people to encourage me. Let's go this way because this is what God's word says. And don't go that way just because the majority of the ones shouting are claiming they're right. Here's another one, this pilot. Same, same text here, uh, but also uh, just focusing in there on 11 to 19. <clears throat> What's he doing? He's pandering. Uh, a lot of people give Pilate a pass. Oh, you know, his hands were tied and this, that, and everything. Pilate was a coward. Pilate was a coward. Pilate was a violent, bloodthirsty, look out for myself, coward. We have too many of those already. Do we not? Do we not need leaders who will say, I'm taking responsibility for this, that guy's innocent, and I'm going to let him go? But oh no, he pandered to the crowd. You know, um, I jotted down here in my notes in Dan's Sunday school class, he talked about, um, he, sh he ended the class with a video, C.C. Winan. And she said, with influence comes responsibility. Mary mentioned um, the cost. Moses, instead of speaking to the rock to bring forth water, he struck it. <clears throat> In, uh, he's, he's angry. And that seemingly, oh, it's just kind of a simple sin, kept him out of the promised land. Uh, there's no such thing as a simple sin, by the way. Uh, it's an offense to God, no matter how small you think it is. But what I want to emphasize here is there's a responsibility with leaders. And we need to quit giving Pilate or our president or our governors or our whatever they are, quit giving them a pass. Oh, I, my hands were tied. I couldn't do anything. You're a liar. You're a coward. You're not a Christian no matter what you claim you are. And we're leading people by the millions into destruction and God's judgment. Take responsibility for your own actions. We should have, you know, we could tell that to Pilate if he was here right now. Um, and the chief priests. Positions of influence and uh, prestige, power, honor. Oh, you know, we just... We, we can't take this blood money and put it into the treasury. That wouldn't look good. We can't stand up and say, I find no fault in this man. Therefore, I'm going to release him. And I'm going to keep this murdering Barabbas in jail until we can kill him. Pray for our leaders, man. They, they, need, they need some backbone informed by Scripture. They need some people to hold them accountable. Why in the world do we keep sending them back to office? Oh, here, here's a gun. Shoot me in the face. Well, I'm getting political, sorry. <clears throat> the danger of giving into parody, what I'm talking about here is a parody um, mocking Jesus Christ. Verse 27. The soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and get, you know, I, soldiers. Um, you know, they probably had to execute dozens and maybe hundreds of people. And I'm sure after a while, you know, the watching blood and watching people breathe their last, they get pretty calloused. And so uh, 
I'm more willing to give the soldiers a pass than the governor, but they have a responsibility here too. And um, they, the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Now it says whole there, so that could be this 600 guys. It's a big bunch of people, whoever it is. And uh, they're not going to take responsibility either. Verse 28, and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they kneeled down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. You know, at some point in the future, they're going to kneel down be before Jesus again. Uh, they won't be mocking then. He will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Eternity, darkness and suffering, separated forever from Jesus Christ. But here, <laughs> they think it's funny. And after weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they kneeled down before him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews! That's not enough. They spit on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head, pressing that acacia wood, big thorn, down into his flesh. Head wounds bleed like crazy. He, there's blood running down his face. And after they had mocked him, they took his robe off and put his garments on him, and they led him away to crucify him. And as they were coming out, they found a man, a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. Unlike the centurion, that I don't know what happened to him, Simon, the Cyrene, shows up in the book of Acts with his sons. He's an evangelist, carrying the cross of Jesus, and seeing what they were doing to him and how they were mocking him and how he died with the words of God on his lips. Cyrene, or Simon, excuse me, the Cyrene uh, was impacted. They press him into service to bear the cross. Some people say it's as much as 75 pounds. No wonder Jesus couldn't carry it after losing all this blood. He's a sleepless night. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't had anything to drink. He's staggering under this weight. Simon, you, we're kind of getting behind here. The Romans say, you know, we got lunchtime coming. Let's get him up there. So they pressed this guy into service. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, verse 33, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mingled with gall. And after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. Um, a lot of people seem to think that that was a, a pain um, medication that it would deaden the pain he was suffering and he was unwilling to drink it he was not willing to reduce his suffering in the least least because god was pouring out his wrath on his son and jesus was going to drink every drop of it And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And they put up over his head the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. In Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So anybody walking by could see, read it in their language. They know what's going on. At the time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left, and those who were passing by hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads. Again, that crowd that's mocking with the soldiers and the robbers initially, the robbers are mocking him too. And those passing by were hurling abuse. Verse 40 saying, you who are, among, uh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him with influence comes responsibility. And all these influencers, the soldiers, the chief priests, the governors, the elders, the scribes, they're all united in one thing. Mock Jesus Christ until he's dead. 
Verse 42, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we shall believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now. And the robbers who also had been crucified with him were casting the same insult at him. The danger of mocking someone. You know, um, at, again, at the risk of sounding political, and I don't mean to, but I just want to, I want to press this home with a contemporary example. Today, Easter Sunday, celebrated by over a billion people worldwide. Today is uh, Transgender Visibility Day. Now, um, that's been happening for a couple years, and it's typically March 31st anyway. This year, it happened to fall on Easter. Last year, our president made this declaration Transgender Visibility Day, on the very day that a transgender guy murdered three Christians. And last year, he didn't mention the murders of Christians. He said the transgender community are being persecuted and are in fear of their lives. Not one word about the followers of Jesus Christ. He is mocking our Lord, I think especially today, Resurrection Day, the most important holiday in all of Christendom. Today, he's mocking our Lord. So the warning here, you better get serious about Jesus Christ before it's too late. They were kneeling before him, mocking him. Oh, hail King Jesus. <laughs> they are going to kneel and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord someday. They better accept his payment now as a savior instead of facing him someday as a judge. And oh, by the way, that's not just for first century soldiers and priests. That's for everybody in this room. Don't mock Jesus. You go through the motions and you go through, you have communion and you join a church. If you haven't received Christ as your savior, do it before it's too late. He died for your sins. He invites you to receive him now. He's coming as a judge. Man, don't gamble with your eternal destiny. <clears throat> the danger of giving in to passivity. Pastor Tyler uh, took some young guys through um, a study last year and um, uh, raising a modern day knight. And part of it was, one of the principles is to reject passivity. Again, somewhere in here, in the mocking of the soldiers and in the crowd saying, crucify him, crucify him, somebody needed to stand up. Instead of just watching what was going on, watching what was happening, and kind of keeping your head down so nobody picks on you, somebody stand up. Reject passivity. Speak out. Speak out for the unborn. Speak out for the, uh, the downtrodden. Speak out for the people that are innocent and being killed and persecuted and tortured for their faith all over the world. Somebody speak up. Reject passivity. Get focused on what God is saying in the scriptures. These signs, there's, there's darkness, there's earthquakes. Uh, in a little while, there's going to be people raising from the grave and walking around town. There's going to be darkness for three hours. There's, there's signs all over in front of these crowds, and what do they do? Nothing. In fact, they sat down and said, let's watch and see if Elijah comes. What, these signs aren't enough? You wanna, you gotta, one more is going to convince you? No, people that are looking for miracles before they will believe won't believe when the miracles show up. All the way through the Bible, it's that way. The Jews saw miracles after miracles after miracles, and what do they do? Let's make a golden calf. What? Didn't you just see the parting of the Red Sea and the, and the Passover and the, the plagues that fell on the e Egyptians and not on us? Well, I don't know where Moses is, so let's make a golden calf. Sound like a good idea. Wasn't somebody there, like a priest, like maybe Aaron, to say, wait a minute, 
guys, stop doing this. Because with influence, it comes responsibility. And Aaron was a coward too. And then when he's called on the carpet, he says, well, I don't know. We threw the gold in the fire and out popped a calf. I don't know. That's a miracle. Man, let's quit making excuses. Let's reject passivity. Let's stand up and speak out and be bold. If we lose our life for it, we lose it. The minute you breathe your last, if you're a Christian, you will be immediately in the presence of Jesus Christ. That sounds like a win to me. And what if, if you go out as a martyr, isn't Jesus going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Isn't that worth more than what the crowds are going to be yelling at me? You're a fool. You're stupid. You're, you're a, you know, you're a, a hater. You're a misogynist. You're a sexist. You're this. You're that. You're a racist. No, I'm a Christian. And I want to stand for truth no matter what the cost. You know, we're going to see some of these leaders, Joseph of Arimathea and uh, Nicodemus. They didn't have the guts to speak up during the trials, as far as we know. It says they didn't acquiesce, or, I mean, they didn't uh, uh, agree to everything, but it doesn't say they, pa- they, they, were, they were not passive. They were just kind of, man, I, I don't agree with this, but I'm not going to say anything. Why? It might hurt my position. I mean, I, I worked hard to get onto the Sanhedrin. I worked hard to earn a black robe and all this fancy stuff and the, the prestige of the, the people looking up to me. I can't risk that. Well, after his crucifixion and all the signs that went on, at least Joseph rejected passivity then. Went to Pilate. Can I have the body so I can take care and honor him with the burial that he deserves? And Pilate says, he's dead already? Sent the soldiers to make sure they broke the legs of the other guys to hasten death. They came to Jesus. No, he, he gave up his spirit already. He's already dead. It doesn't mean his torture was shortened. It means it was finished. Reject passivity and reject pretense. The centurion, verse 54, as I mentioned, I'm not sure. Maybe this guy turned around his life. I sure hope so. Um, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verse 47, it says the centurion, when he was saying this, he was praising God. So verse 54 in Matthew 27, now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, truly this was the Son of God. Now, a centurion, he's in charge of a 100 soldiers. This isn't his first rodeo. This isn't his first execution. But he saw something different. Truly, this was the Son of God. That's the same confession that Peter made. Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And they had this and that and the other thing. And then Peter says uh, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter went on to greater things. I don't know of any place in the Bible that says this centurion went on to greater things. I hope he did. Because just saying Jesus is the Son of God doesn't save you. Intellectually agreeing, oh yeah, he's got the credentials, and boy, the events surrounding his death are incredible. He must have been the Son of God. That's not going to get you into heaven. I'll show you here in a minute what will. Um, <clears throat> again, at the risk of beaten up on ladies, uh, verses 55 and 56. And many women were there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom was Mary Magdalene, along with Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Faithful women 
who, by the way, were the first to witness and testify of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But elsewhere, Luke 23, 28, Jesus said, as he's stumbling under the weight of this cross and he's falling down and people are trying to minister to him and they're weeping, Jesus says in Luke 23, 28, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children. These chief priests influencing the crowds to hate Jesus and to kill Jesus, those chief priests said, let his guilt, his blood be on us and on our children. They pronounced the judgment on the entire nation of Israel. Because of their arrogance, their deception, their unwillingness to recognize that Jesus Christ was who he said he was and the Father had sent the heir of all things to minister to them. They killed him just like they did all the other prophets. And then they pronounced their own judgment. Let his blood be on us and on our children. A lot of leaders do that. A lot of leaders lead their whole nations into the judgment of God. A lot of pastors, a lot of pastors lead their whole congregation into the judgment of God. A lot of fathers, a lot of fathers lead their whole families into the judgment of God. They need more than just saying Jesus is the Son of God. They need to receive him by faith as their savior. They need to acknowledge they cannot do it on their own. They have a debt to pay that they could never meet and that Jesus Christ meets it and pays for it on the cross. And then they have to build their children's lives and their whole family and their own life on the word of God. National leaders build their, their whole administration should be informed by the word of God Pastors need to preach the word of God instead of building their own stupid little kingdom and quit leading people to hell. Well, there's one more guy I want you to meet. Uh, we've already introduced him a little bit in verses 15 to 22. His name is Barabbas. Verse 26, Matthew 27 then Pilate released Barabbas for them, but after having Jesus scourged, he delivered him to be crucified. <laughs> that, that verse 26 is so packed. Pilate knew Barabbas was guilty. Barabbas wasn't waiting for trial. He was waiting for execution. He was scheduled to be on that middle cross. And Pilate knew he was guilty, but he let him go. And he knew Jesus was innocent. And first he tortured him. And then he killed him. Well, there is a pardon going on here, though. And it's this guy, Barabbas. He gets a pardon. Just quickly, some things here. <clears throat> this is uh, from C.I. Schofield, the old guy, uh, uh, Schofield Bible. Barabbas was condemned to, die, to die. No one has ever questioned the justice of his sentence. He was a rebel against the law, a robber and a murderer. And now the outraged law had laid strong hands on him and he lay bound under sentence of death. He was not under probation, but under condemnation. He was not awaiting trial, but execution. Just before him, as his only prospect, was the awful death of crucifixion. And he knew what that meant. He's just hours away, sleepless night. And then somebody comes into his cell and says, you're free to go. Can you imagine the relief? That's exactly what substitutionary atonement is. Jesus Christ, I was in that jail cell 
I deserve death. I should have been crucified because of my sins. And Jesus Christ said, I'll take your place. He knew he was condemned. He knew what he had done. He knew he was guilty. And they'd already passed sentence. Tomorrow at this time, Barabbas, you're going to be dead. A horrible death. He knew the one before him was innocent. He had heard about Jesus. He'd been there for a while. There's rumblings going on all over the place. The jail was right over there where he was scourged. He knew that Jesus was a true substitute. Everybody else in this room, we can debate what it means to be a, a substitutionary uh, atonement. And we can talk all the theology you want. This guy was just hours away from his own horrible execution. And somebody came in there and said, your debt has been paid. You're free to walk. That's what the crucifixion and the resurrection, that's what we're celebrating today. You were under the sentence of death and you deserved it. And Jesus Christ said, I paid your sin, paid your debt. You're free to go. He knew that he could do nothing to merit this interposition. There's an old hymn that talks about uh, the blood of Jesus was interposed on my behalf. Took, he took my place. And uh, Bar Barabbas knew, you know, he didn't contribute to that. <laughs> he didn't send a, a note to Jesus, hey, can you pardon me? Or is there something I can do to get out of this mess? He knew he was scheduled for execution tomorrow. And fifth, he knew that Christ's death for him was perfectly efficacious. Why? He was set free. As far as we know, he was never charged with, he, he couldn't have been charged for that again. He might have done some bad stuff, I hope not. But he was set free. Your penalty, Barabbas, was nailed to the cross with this guy that just took your place. Wow. Well, it's Easter. We can't leave Jesus in the tomb, now can we? <clears throat> God demonstrated. He accepted the payment of Christ made on the cross by raising him up on the third day. 1 John 2.2, 2, another one of those uh, fancy words like interposition and atonement. Propitiation. My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. They offered Jesus that sour wine to try and deaden the pain. Jesus said, no. I'm taking every drop of God's wrath paid for the sins of the entire world. But only those who receive him by faith have that blood applied to your account. You say, well, I, I, I can do it on my own. <laughs> no, you're just like Barabbas. You're scheduled for execution tomorrow. There's nothing you can contribute except allowing the substitute to take your place. Jesus Christ. So one more trip around the mountain, Luke 24. After the burial, the resurrection, and for 40 days. See, the, the empty tomb is, is important. Nowhere near as important as the post-resurrection appearances. We would still be under the law right now. Oh, somebody came and took the body. We don't know where it is. You know, that's irrelevant. There was eyewitness testimony. Jesus Christ appeared, not once, ten times. And one time to over 500 people at once. Uh, you can't say, oh, that was just a hallucination. You don't have mass hallucinations testifying. And these guys were willing to die for what they believed. So when he had led them out as far as Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about while he was blessing them, he parted from them. Paul says about 30 years after the resurrection that he said, some of these 500 people are still alive. You don't believe me? Go ask them. They saw Jesus alive. That's what makes Easter so special. 
The empty tomb is pretty cool. But the post-resurrection experiences seal the deal. They handled him. They had breakfast with him. He said, touch me. And he said, uh, I'm going away for a while. I'm going to send the spirit, but I'm coming back personally. And that's when he comes back to this Mount of Olives again. Zechariah 14, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations and when he fights on a day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of the Jerusalem on the east, and the mount will be split in its middle from east to west. This same Jesus, physical, not spiritual, he raised in a body. If you don't believe that, you're not a Christian. Can I say that again? If you do not believe in the physical resurrection, you have no hope. And if there isn't a physical resurrection, there's no evidence that he, he said, hey, touch me. I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. If it's a spiritual resurrection, anybody can claim that. Muhammad could claim he was spiritually raised. How can you disprove it? But a physical resurrection, oh, yeah, they saw him. They touched him. He kept popping in every once in a while, unexpected, for 40 days. I think he was getting them ready for the rapture. If you don't know when he's coming for you, you better be ready. And the mount will be split. He's coming back in power and in glory to destroy his enemies. Don't find yourself on the wrong side. <laughs> if you see Jesus Christ coming back on a white horse and you're looking him in the eye, you're in trouble. The church will be coming back in his taillights. And he's going to be destroying his enemies, and we're going to be along for the ride. But don't wait until it's too late. Well, let's close with a wonderful Easter song. God bless you. Thank you for your patience.